Hi, I'm Mike Gridley and welcome to Powerboat Television. Now over the years, I've been fortunate enough to call Southern Georgian Bay and the 30,000 Islands my home cruising waters. Now back in 2004, we did our very first Discover Cruising DVD on the 30,000 Islands. So this year we've come back to update that in high definition. So over the next three episodes, come with us as we enjoy the cruise from Southern Georgian Bay to Killarney following the small craft route. Georgian Bay is a vast expanse of 15,000 square kilometers of water, large enough really to be the fifth Great Lake. While boaters can be found in every corner of the bay, the vast majority choose to explore the 30,000 islands, the finest freshwater cruising ground in the world. The largest communities on the sound are Penetanguishen and Midland. Both towns are home to several marinas and a large number of seasonal and transient boaters who enjoy the waters of southern Georgian Bay every weekend. A popular marina on Severn Sound is Queen's Cove in Victoria Harbour. Offering the only covered slips on Georgian Bay, this friendly marina has a host of amenities and services that make it a great jumping off point with the southern tip of Beausoleil Island in view. Now well, if you've been traveling to reach Georgian Bay along the Trent Severn and have arrived at Gloucester Pool, just before Lock 45 there's a great place to stop before you head out in the bay and that's Starport Severn. Starport is a full-service marina that caters to transient and seasonal boaters alike. Their main facilities above Lock 45 provide everything from a chandelier to a boater's clubhouse. Below the lock is their expansive sales and service operation. When cruising out onto the bay from its southern ports or the Trent Severn waterway, one of the most popular destinations is Beausoleil Island, part of the Georgian Bay Islands National Park. Beausoleil is a boater's dream with sand beaches and open anchorages on its southern end. As you work your way north, the island transitions to the granite and pine trees of the rugged Canadian Shield. Exploring in and around the island reveals wonderfully scenic and protected anchorages like Ojibwe and Chimney Bays off Beausoleil Bay to the well-protected Frying Pan Bay at the island's northern reach. Not far from Beausoleil is Honey Harbour, where many cruisers find themselves passing through. Picnic Island is a great stop to fuel up, get some provisions, and grab an ice cream cone. If you're looking to pamper yourself, look no further than South Bay Cove Marina. Here you will find expansive state-of-the-art docks to handle large cruisers and customer service that is second to none. During your stay, enjoying an excellent meal and a glass from the wine cellar at the top of the Cove restaurant is an absolute must. Just east of the small craft route, north of Beausoleil Island, are the Musquash Anchorages. The first of these is locally known as Hockey Stick Bay, an obvious choice given its shape. Tucked into the top of Bone Island, this is a well-sheltered and quiet spot. Across from Bone, opposite Jones Point, is Brown Bay. This large anchorage with depths of 20 feet is popular with some of the larger vessels cruising the 30,000 islands. Next door to Brown is the long and narrow Longuisa Bay. Larger craft tend to anchor midway down past the cottages, while smaller craft head further in. If you arrive early enough, there's a great spot to tuck into at the end of the bay. Back along the shore of Bone Island is Getchewan Island Anchorage, and a second more sheltered, hence busier bay, created by a protective island. From the Musquash, the small craft route heads upbound through Muskoka Landing and Monument Channels, heading for San Susi and the nearby anchorages of the Moon River. Join us later in the show as we tour more of Georgian Bay's 30,000 Islands. Welcome back to Powerboat Television as we pass O'Donnell Point and the top of 12 Mile Bay heading for the Moon River area in the Massasauga Provincial Park. This area contains a multitude of secluded and peaceful spots to drop anchor. To get to these anchorages, follow the northern entrance to the moon. It's illustrated on the chart by the dashed red line starting at the southern tip of San Susi Island and proceeding around the top of Houston Island. You will come to the day market Pilgrim's Point, 
on Winnet Island. Just past it, small emerald island in the center marks the split in the route. Head to port for Three Finger and to starboard for Port Rawson. After cruising past Emerald to the north and along Kinnear Island, you will pass Veal Point and turn into Three Finger Bay, which is sometimes called Five Finger Bay. Three Finger Bay has mooring pins on the rocks, and because it is a provincial park site, it also has a number of campfire pits and campsites. There's space to anchor in all of the arms of the bay, except the far west one, which is accessible only through a narrow passage. Although it's inaccessible to cruising boats, it's a great bay to explore by dinghy. There's plenty of shoreline, so you can usually find a quiet place to anchor alone and enjoy the peace, quiet, and the natural beauty of the bay. To reach Port Ralston Bay, head south of Emerald Island, around the north of Crooked Island, and follow the day markers, which are the only navigation aids. You will find the trip up to Port Ralston a scenic one. So pull the throttles back, take your time, and enjoy the cruise. Just take it one day mark at a time as you pass through the islands. It's best to enter Port Ralston Bay from the southeast side of Bear Island where the channel is wider with a depth of 19 feet. Wide open, Port Ralston Bay provides several small anchoring bays to choose from, but since it is so open, be mindful of the wind direction when selecting an anchorage. There's enough fetch in the bay to kick up a good chop in the wind. You will also find camp and day use sites throughout the area if you want to spend some time ashore. In the northern arm along the northwest shore, a few mooring buoys have been installed to tie off to. However, there is a fee for this convenience, which is collected by park staff in the evening. One of the most popular anchorages in Massasauga, Echo Bay, is back out along the western edge of the park, tucked in behind Sansusu and Echo Islands. Although the channel into the bay is narrow, there's plenty of water depth that ranges from 21 feet at the entrance to 9 feet at the end. Echo Bay is divided into two arms. The anchorage is the southern arm, while the northern arm can be explored by dinghy. The anchorage has plenty of depth ranging from 11 feet to 14 feet, with ample room for larger vessels to swing in the center of the bay. A well-sheltered bay, Echo is ideal for hanging around for a few days to tour the area by dinghy and hop over to Henry's for lunch or dinner. But if you prefer, you can secure a dock at Henry's. Just radio ahead on VHF and ask the dockmaster for a slip assignment. It's a great place to meet up with fellow boaters and enjoy a meal and good times. The restaurant features fresh Georgian Bay fish served up family style in big bowls in the middle of the table. Well, we've had a great day in the water. Really enjoyed the cruise today on Georgian Bay. Now really looking forward to settling in for the evening here at Henry's, catching a great sunset, but also having a fantastic fish dinner. Now, a hundred years ago, when Perry Sound was first settled, it was all about the white pine and the railway. Now the focus is on the water for recreational boating. The best and therefore the most popular facility for transient boaters is Big Sound Marina, which is owned by the town and operated by the Chamber of Commerce. After checking in, I caught up with Perry Harris from the Chamber to chat about the marina and Perry Sound. Well, first of all, welcome to beautiful Big Sound Marina on the shores of Georgian Bay's Inner Harbor at Perry Sound. We are very fortunate in our area to have uh, the Inner Harbor, first of all, Big Sound Marina, which is 120 transient slips, full amenities on site, and we also have the Town Dock, which is our Town Dock Pier. Our area has so much to offer. We have the bay, we have inland lakes, and in the town of Perry Sound, there are so many different restaurants and retail locations. We really have all here. Historically, our area was founded on lumber, um, then can, went from lumber into more of attraction to the American tourists with the American cottages. And then it's just growing forward and forward into, into tourism, uh, and which is fantastic for the area. So, you know, there's a lot of historical sites that we have. You know, north we have, uh, over in the island we have Depot Harbor. If you go north, we have the CIL plant that was here uh, during, you know, war am ammunitions and so forth. Due to the quality of the marina and the amenities available in town, many boating groups choose Perry Sound as the location for their annual rendezvous, like the Great Lakes Cruising Club did this past summer. And if you're lucky enough to be around July 1st, you can join in the daytime festivities on the town dock. 
then settle back on your boat for some awesome fireworks over the harbor. Departing Big Sound Marina, outbound on the small craft route, it's a short cruise to Kilbear Provincial Park, one of the most popular destinations on Perry Sound. Beyond the park, most cruisers elect to continue to follow the small craft route with a stop at Franklin Island's Regatta Bay. But the more adventurous may wish to continue around the west side of the island to spend time in Shark Bay on Windsor Island. Once through the narrow entrance, you'll discover a remarkable anchorage worth spending a few days in. The cruise from Franklin takes you north past Narrows Island, west out the Shebeshikon Channel, and then north again along the more open Shawanaga Inlet. Throughout this passage you will find several anchorages, but one of my favorites is a side trip up the Shawanaga River. The Shawanaga River has not been charted for depths, but for the most part it's clear of hazards. However, there is a shoal located one mile upriver. You need to take a curving path to port to avoid the shoal, which should be visible just under the surface of the water. A private marker helps identify its actual position. Well, we just came through that really narrow spot here on the Shawanaga River and you go, how did you know to do that? How did you know to get in here? Because this is not on the chart, whether it's paper or GPS. Well, obviously with one of our Discover Cruising guides, to discover the Georgian Bay's 30,000 islands to be exact, or through the Great Lakes Cruising Club, either in print or on their uh, CD and DVD collections, you'll find the information you need, which is a detailed chart of how to make it up the Shawanaga River. Stretches of the river have fouled timber on the bottom, so the best spots to drop the hook are in the south and north anchorages, which are located where an island splits the river. These are two great spots to gunk hole, but the reason many boaters come here is to swing on the hook and enjoy the sights and sounds of the Cascades. From Shawanaga Inlet, we cruised along the inside route past Barclay Island and up the Brignall Banks Narrows, heading for Point of Barrow. While Point of Barrow is not normally a cruising destination, we were able to find fuel in a slip at Damasden's Boat Works and hit the town dock next door for a pump out and some provisions. Later in the show we'll have more from Georgian Bay's 30,000 Islands. We're at the intersection of the shortcut from behind Shawinaga Island where we came in to Point of Arrow Station last night. Now we're heading outbound down the main channel to the Point of Barrow Lighthouse and into the open water. Heading down the channel is a straightforward run with plenty of aids for navigation. Cottages line the shores, so there's plenty of small boat traffic. Well, we've reached the end of Middle Channel and Point of Barrow Channel here just before it goes out past the Point of Barrow Lighthouse. Now this is where you want to really know what the current weather conditions are, particularly the winds and waves and from what direction, because now you're committed to the open water and of course committed to trying to get around Hangdog Channel, which is not a great thing to be doing when the waves are kicking up. Before hitting the bay, you'll pass the historic Point of Barrow Lighthouse and the barrel on the rock point that gives this area its name, which translates to Point of the Barrel. When the first boats navigated the waters of Georgian Bay in the mid-1800s, a barrel would be erected with a lantern placed on top to guide boats into the channel after dark or an event of a storm. This served as the first lighthouse on Point of Barrow. The run down the channel to the open water and the red green red biification buoy is just over a mile from the lighthouse. At this point you can head for the open bay or follow the rocky shore along the new small craft route that was established in 2004. Review the charts before heading to Hangdog Reef and Hangdog Channel because there's no turning back. After working along the shore, the route heads out along the reef. Having spotted the day beacon on the end of the visible reef, continue offshore and then turn sharply around the red marker heading south, as this boat has, and then proceed inland following the range inbound on Hangdog Channel. At this point, you have a chance to catch your breath, take in the scenery, and the calmer waters and enjoy the trip towards Alexander Passage. Alexander Passage offers the last sheltered waters before heading out into the open bay 
for a 10 mile run to the approach to Brett. So you may wish to hold back in one of the anchorages at miles 43 and 44. After passing the Brit Lighthouse, boaters should follow the lit range into the well-marked channel leading to Bing Inlet and Brit. We had a great cruise today. We had no problems getting around Hangdog. Mind you, the winds picked up as the day progressed and the open crossing was a little bit rough. But the Larson 927, it's 30 feet, handled that really, really well. So now we've arrived at Bing Inlet in Brit. So let's check out what the services are here for cruising boaters. Two marinas serve transient boaters in Brit. The first is Wright's, a family-run business since 1950. Here you will find everything from fuel to showers, a well-stocked chandlery, and a service team to help you out. Further up the inlet is St. Amand's Waterfront Inn. The marina here provides all of the services you'd expect, as well as grocery with hardware in an LCBO outlet. With quaint lodgings and a restaurant overlooking Georgian Bay, this was a convenient place to drop into when we were filming the aerials for the new Discover Cruising DVD. If you're staying overnight, you may also wish to consider a room at the Brit Inn, or at the very least, enjoy an excellent meal in the intimate dining room or a cold one in the pub. Well, that wraps up another great day on the water. So to cap off the evening, gonna go in for a cold beer and a great meal. Heading from Bing Inlet to Killarney will take you through 64 miles of some of the most spectacular yet remote areas of the 30,000 islands. Services are virtually non-existent, barring a few outposts, so provision and fuel accordingly. But the scenery makes it worth the effort, especially the windswept islands and secluded anchorages that remind you of paintings by the Group of Seven. Before heading out from Brit, check the weather. Winds from the north and west will make some of the open stretches of water extremely uncomfortable and difficult to navigate, especially when the markers can't be spotted in four foot or more seas. The first leg of the cruise takes you around Bigwood Island and down North Channel to Cunningham's Island. Once clear of Cunningham's Channel, you approach the first of two anchorages along this route, Black Bay. This is a tricky anchorage to enter from the small craft route or from behind Golden Sword Island, so you may wish to set your hook in the Golden Sword anchorage and explore Black Bay by dinghy first to check things out. Leaving Golden Sword behind, it's a short well marked run from Sandy Bay to the next bottleneck, Roger's Gut. It's tight but passable, even for beamy boats as long as they draft less than five feet. Clearing Rogers Gut, there is a nice little anchorage tucked in on the south side of Rogers Island, with a great rock wall to secure while you let the gang have some time ashore. Our next stop on the way north is Henvey Inlet, due east of Rogers Island. While there are no nav aids, the route is quite straightforward. After passing through the two unnamed islands, a wonderful anchorage opens up to port. If you arrive early enough, you can tie stern to the rock shore for a quiet stay. From mile 13 off Hevney Inlet, the small craft route runs up to Key Harbor, then heads west past Ocas Island and Dead Island, moving through more open water, heading for the Bustard Islands or the alternate route inland. Just past Dead Island, you'll enter into the open water and have the choice of either turning out at marker D57 to take the open run across the Northeast Passage to the Bustards or turn inland to enjoy the scenic route, discovering more anchorages and facing the challenge of Obstacle Island. Choosing the inland route, you'll have to navigate the tight and twisty Dory's Run just off Fox Island, but there are some great anchorages for you to set up in. The first is found in between Fox and Vixen Islands, where you can tuck in a cove along Fox's west shore. There is another popular spot between Major and Finger Islands, and a third option that can be found on the west side of Vixen Island. 
At the end of a leisurely cruise from the Fox Islands lies the reason many boaters follow the main route to the Bustards rather than enjoy this area at the mouth of the French River. It's appropriately called Obstacle Island. But it's not the island itself that's the problem, it's Obstacle Rock sitting smack in the middle of Parting Channel. Rounding the island, you are faced with a large outcropping of rocks in the centre of the channel. There is a tight swing through the markers. This presents a real challenge for boats over 36 feet in length, but it really is worth the side trip if you can slip through. Just offshore from the main outlet of the French River lies the number one destination in the northern section of the 30,000 Islands, the Bustard Island Group. Hidden amongst this randomly scattered collection of granite islands are two principal anchorages as well as several intricate channels in which to gunk hole. The first anchorage is found past Northeast Island as soon as you arrive at the Bustards. The entrance is long and narrow so head to the end of the bay and anchor in the protection of Thai Island for a more sheltered spot. The most popular and protected anchorage in the Bustards is Bustard Islands Harbour which is accessed from the west down the gun barrel and nestled in behind the islands of Burnt, Strawberry and Teal. The first anchoring bay is straight past Pearl Island between Thai and Green Islands. Sheltered from all but the northwest winds, this location will provide you with a wonderful view back up the gun barrel to the Bustard Lights. The main anchoring area of Bustard Islands Harbour opens up before you. There is plenty of room for boats of all sizes to swing on the hook in the open bay or tucked away in one of the corners of the harbour. Northwest of the Bustards is another must-see anchorage in the Bad River Channel. While the entrance to the Bad River can be a little intimidating, particularly on a windy or cloudy day, it's well worth a visit. So if it's your first time, choose a calm sunny day to venture in. After working up the entrance past the granite islands and shoals, you'll pass an uncharted market of port, indicating a shoal just off the island. The main anchorage is just past the island, or you can head to starboard down the long channel that runs east from the anchorage. Boats can tie to the rock wall along the channel, so you may want to bring along some climbing pipings. From the Bad River, it's 13 and a half miles of open water until you turn into Beaverstone Bay. Passing northward through the bay, you'll find anchorages at Nobles Island, Muskrat Bay, and Sheep Islands. As you enter Collins Inlet at the top of the bay, you are in for a real treat. This long waterway might seem to be a river estuary to cruising boaters, but it's not. It's actually an extension of the bay that surrounds and forms the large Philip Edward Island. Halfway along the inlet, you come to the waters of Mill Lake, another great place to drop the hook, explore, or just relax. Traveling west out of Collins Inlet into the open water, it's just a short trip to reach and round the Killarney Light and head into the busy channel at Killarney. After a splendid run from southern Georgian Bay, it was great to arrive in Killarney and check in at the Sportsman Inn where we had a transient slip and a luxurious room overlooking the channel. I also appreciated the wonderful menu offered in the dining room versus my onboard cooking. The day after our arrival, Killarney Channel began filling up with the big guns as participants in the Jefferson Beach Yacht Sales Rendezvous arrived from Michigan. Before long, the docks at the Sportsman Inn were filled up with Vikings, Sun Seekers, and other big yachts. With everyone settled in, Greg Kruger, president of Jefferson Beach, extended a welcome and kicked off the activities. Task one was to christen members of the flotilla who had been launched since the last rendezvous. Over the next few days, the crew at the Sportsman Inn took care of their rendezvous guests with fine dining, great barbecues, and live entertainment. Well, that wraps up our cruise of Georgian Bay's 30,000 Islands, one of the finest freshwater cruising grounds in the world. We hope you've had as much fun as we've had, especially here at our final weekend at our destination of Killarney at the Sportsman Inn, joining in on Jefferson Beach Yacht Sales Viking Rendezvous.